All right, so my presentation today is on exercise adherence and exercise barriers. So the purpose of this presentation, you guys are gonna be taking the role of a person who is sedentary, maybe a family member, a friend you know who is inactive and maybe possible barriers they might come across. So to start, um, we just need to break it down to its, into its simplest terms. What is exercise adherence? So we can break down exercise adherence as the maintenance of an active involvement in physical exercise, as simple as that. So um, those with strong exercise adherence continue participating in exercise despite opportunities, opportunities and pressures to withdraw. That is the dictionary definition. It basically means that people with high amounts of exercise adherence are able to continue their habits for regular physical activity. Um, they're able to find the both intrinsic, intrinsic and extrinsic motivation to exercise and achieve their long-term goals. So if we are talking about exercise adherence, we can't really talk about it without bringing up self-efficacy. And so self-efficacy is the belief that an individual is capable of achieving their goals. It's kind of that internal drive, that self-motivation that people have, the trust and belief in yourself to complete an activity. And uh, people with high self-efficacy, they can be seen saying statements like, I believe that I can decrease my mile time by 15 seconds. Um, in order to spark a change, they need to kind of set a goal to start off. So if they set this goal in the very beginning, and they are committed to the program and they, they consistently um, work hard day in and day out, then they can see these uh, changes in the long term. They can find out that they could decrease their mile time by 15 seconds or even more. So that's one way that uh, self-efficacy is used in a competitive setting to kind of increase and improve performance. Um, but it also can be used in the general population setting where uh, a person could say, I believe I can complete all 12 weeks of my weight loss program. This is a really good accomplishment for a lot of people because 12 weeks is a decently long time. And so um, working through the program, say if it might be like three days a week or five days a week, whatever it may be, um, the person works hard each and every day and believes in their capabilities and becomes more confident throughout the program. And eventually, once they're done with the program, they're able to celebrate and say, hey, look what I did. I believed in myself the whole time I was able to do it. So people with high self-efficacy have that high drive and high motivation to do well for themselves. And then um, why would people have low self-efficacy? Why would a person be kind of not confident in their abilities to do something? So that could be previous injury. Someone who's injured, they really don't want to make it any worse. Um, they understand that um, certain activities might kind of uh, be painful and make exercise not fun and not enjoyable for them. So really finding ways to um, work around that and maybe find exercises that can uh, spare the back or spare the joints are, are effective ways to kind of make sure that we want to participate in exercises. But if a person is experiencing pain while exercising, then they're not going to likely want to come back because it makes them uncomfortable and they, they don't want to kind of re-aggravate or make their condition possibly worse. Um, and same thing goes with arthritic joints and knee, knee and hip issues. If people are waking up and going to bed with their joints sore and stuff like that, they're not going to be feel very motivated to exercise. And along with that, um, people might have slow self-efficacy because it might be too difficult or challenging. Us, we people, us being exercise professionals, we know um, how equipment works, what to do, how to do it, certain programming styles and, and what works in the exercise field. But there's a lot of people who just don't know and they're not educated enough to realize um, what to do. If a person has, has never been to a gym before and they're trying to get into exercise, they might show up and they see a million different pieces of equipment, a million different um, means to exercise and they wouldn't know where to start. So it can be intimidating if, uh, if it's too complicated or it might be too challenging off the start if they're not as experienced. And then another reason why people have low self-efficacy is hard stuff habits. Um, a lot of people are just stuck in their ways. I don't want to throw this term around a lot, but some people might get lazy and not kind of want to promote that change right off the start. So um, some people are so stuck in their ways that they don't, um, they have a hard time wanting to commit to exercise because they're just so used to not exercising, staying in that comfort zone. So here are some ways we can increase the self-efficacy. Self-efficacy increases people's um, ability to succeed. So one of the resources that we can use to increase self-efficacy is using mastery experiences. So if I want to get better at doing a back squat, I can really simply just do a back squat. I want to get really good at swinging a golf club, I'm going to be swinging a golf club. It's really that simple. It's as specific as we can get. We want to get them better at that movement by doing that said movement. And so another uh, similar way to increase self-efficacy could be vicarious experience. So this is mainly a visual cue, watching people do something. So uh, we have, nowadays we have a lot of resources like YouTube and other, and other kind of video platforms we, where we can see activities done in real time and also slow them down to see what parts we're missing in the movement and kind of what parts we need to key in on if we're missing those, those um, details. 
And additionally, uh, another place where this can be seen, the vicarious experience, is in a group fitness setting. So um, what usually happens via is there's an instructor who is at the front mirroring and teaching the movement to everyone, and then uh, all the participants in the class are able to kind of replicate what the instructor's doing, and they're saying, okay, I see my instructor is doing the movement this way, I gotta adjust it and change my body to make it look like that. And so that's one way we can increase a person's confidence in their ability to do the movement by mirroring them and showing them what it's supposed to look like. And then another thing is verbal persuasion, where you can kind of use words of success and positivity, compliments, encouragement, all this stuff to help them increase their ability, their kind of mental perception of um, being able to do the task successfully. So if anyone's ever been into like a football weight room or seen videos of like um, people doing maximal lifts in like a football team setting, it gets pretty rowdy and wild in there. You get people hollering, yelling, screaming, doing all this extra stuff to give that person under the barbell the motivation to get that weight up. So um, people use it really effectively. They, uh, they get out all their energy and they try to make sure that person is motivated and it gives them the, uh, the ability and the confidence to, to perform that lift and execute it. And another thing is physiological feedback. So this is basically kind of communicating back and forth what, it, what it's feeling like, what it's supposed to feel like, where you are feeling the movement. So like, for example, if I'm instructing someone and we're doing like a RDL, I, I need to tell them, okay, when you're doing this activity, try to focus on feeling it in your hamstrings. And if there's a discrepancy in there and the client says, oh, I feel it in my, in my calf or something like that, or I feel it more in my upper back, then you kind of gotta talk to them and realize, okay, what strategies are working, what parts of the movement are we missing? And so um, physiological feedback is that back and forth talking about what the movement is feeling like and kind of how, uh, how we go about that. So those are some ways to increase self-efficacy. But what are some barriers to exercise that prevent um, people from being able to participate? So first of all, what barriers are is there factors that prevent or limit the ability or desire to perform and participate in physical activities? So um, in this specific case, barriers, um, People who have barriers, they want to make the behavior change, they have the intention, they understand the benefits of exercise, they want to incorporate more exercise in their daily life, but these barriers in their life are preventing them from getting that adequate amount of exercise. And this is different from excuses. Excuses are the person doesn't truly want to make the change. They're, like I'm gonna bring that back that word, lazy. Um, they have no desire to make the actual change. They understand, yeah, it might be helpful, but I don't want to put in all that work. I don't want to kind of, uh, give all that effort for, uh, for something that I might not like. So that's a big difference. People with barriers, they're trying to exercise, but these factors, these barriers are limiting them from participating. And so there's a whole bunch of types of different barriers. I don't have them all, but these are a few that I'm going to be talking about. So stuff like physical bar barriers, time barriers, social barriers, geographical barriers, and age barriers. So we'll start off with the physical barriers. So physical barriers to exercise are probably one of the common reasons that people say, oh, I can't exercise because I have this going on or like this is getting in the way. And so one of the big reasons is injury. Um, I kind of raced on this before a little bit, but people who, actually, people who have an injury, they don't really want to do anything that would make it worse. So for example, if I'm experiencing chronic back pain and I, and I have a hard time getting in and out of bed every single morning, it's not going to be very advisable for me to do a movement that might make my pain worse or inflame kind of the area that's firing up in my back. So um, understanding that building in regressions and stuff that can spare um, certain parts of your body, maybe injured parts of your body, are important to realize. So um, making sure we know where can we take an exercise. If it's painful doing this movement, how can we do it to make it less painful and kind of make it easier on that person while also still um, being efficient and getting an effective lift in. So understanding where, where can we, we can go on regressions in regards to injury, what part of them is injured, and how can I manipulate the exercise to make it a more suitable for this person. And another physical barrier is body weight. There's a lot of people who want to get started in exercise, but they're just simply too big. Their body mass is, is kind of holding them back and preventing them from exercising for a long period of time. And so we can go about this by uh, really taking into account exercises that can take away that, um, that weight-bearing aspect. So putting people in a pool or having them on a seated bike can really help them go for longer and, and can reduce the kind of the pressure on the knees, ankles, stuff like that, 
uh, that would be the limiting factor when we try to do something like walking or, uh, or jogging, something like that realm. So um, it's important to understand we can do other means to work around body weight as well. And then disability, um, some physical barriers include um, people might want to get active if they have like certain uh, muscle spasticity or muscle rigidity. Um, stuff like machines can be really useful for these type of populations because it restricts the plane of movement and doesn't allow us to, for as much a free, free flowing movement. Um, when you work with free weights and dumbbells, barbells, stuff like that, it allows for all planes of motion, but when we use machines, it kind of restricts the movement and allows people who don't have the greatest muscle control and uh, muscular endurance, um, those machines are a good option for them. And then prosthetics as well, um, a person who might have a limb, um, it's like a limb who's no longer there, they might use a prosthetic to kind of uh, participate in exercise and kind of get back to uh, to where they want to be and uh, participate in what they can. Then we've got time barriers. Time barriers also is a big, big thing that people say that prevents them from exercising. They say, I'm just too busy, it can't fit in my schedule. There's absolutely no time, they say. And so this is one that common people over, commonly people over exaggerate. Um, I would say for people who say they don't have any time, you would just consult with them and say, okay, from when you wake up, when you go to bed, there's definitely some time we can find. So let's just go through, you eat breakfast, you take a shower, all right, do we have some time there? Do we have some time in the middle of the day, time at the end of the day? Basically, we need to teach them that something is better than nothing, and so if you say you have no time to exercise and you don't do anything, that's much worse than if you find 10 minutes in the morning, exercise a little bit, and find little pieces throughout the day, that's gonna be a much better um, alternative than you just saying, nope, I don't have any time, I can't exercise whatsoever. So. Um, understand, telling them that, hey, you don't need to se like separate an hour of your day to do exercise. You can do li little by little, piece by piece. And even, all additionally, you can include it into your day. So like, for example, if you could bike your walk to work and that you don't need to set, a, set time aside in your day to exercise, you can just have that be a part of your day, a part of your commute. And so that can be a way to work around it. Another thing to take into account is childcare. So, I, I will say taking care of a child is much more important than exercising if you have to do one or the other. But it doesn't have to be so black and white. Um, there can definitely be s some inclusive activities for both the child and the mother or father. And so things like walks and things like play that can also increase the um, parent's physical activity, but it can also teach the kids good habits and kind of have them uh, develop a good exercise mindset early on in their lives. So, then we got social barriers. So. These are the like kind of the family, friends, coworkers, basically the people around you that you see every day or every week or so. And one issue that a lot of people can come across with um, is that people don't really have a great supportive net around them. They might have a group of people like friends that they care about and they like spending time with, but those friends might also not share the same values about exercise that they do. And so they might not want to participate with you. They might not want to be a part of the behavior change you're making. And so. Um, I have it down here, um, farther down on the slide, it says you can find places where you do have support. So if your family, friends don't support you, they don't understand, you can always reach out to other health clubs or maybe even Facebook groups and find people with similar interests. And that can help you stay motivated too. So working past that barrier by saying, all right, maybe my family, my friends, they're not that interested in my habits, but I can always find people who are, who are similar to me and they, they kind of have that same build of me and maybe a similar background story and kind of gravitate towards them and find motivation with those people that are like you. And then um, another social barrier that people come across is anxiety and uh, bigger social settings. Um, there's a lot of times where people find it intimidating to go to the gym because they don't want to be in front of a bunch of people. They don't want to potentially embarrass themselves. They think they're being judged all the time, even if they might not be. And one way to work around this is simply just getting a friend or getting a buddy. I know uh, when I have a workout partner, it's kind of like that friendly, competitive relationship where you want to push each other and you want to be better than that person, but you, that person also wants to be better than you, so you kind of have that healthy back and forth, and it really helps them keep you motivated. Because if one person doesn't want to go to the gym one day, and uh, the other person does, you can kind of say, like, hey, come on, let's, let's, let's get after it, let's keep on sticking to it. And so you can kind of, kind of have that reliance on each other, which helps uh, promote adherence to exercise. Then we got some geographical barriers. So this has to do with location, where you at, where you are, and how that affects your ability to exercise. 
So right here we can have urbanization. So this is kind of in more densely populated metro areas. There's less accessible parks, gyms, fields, basically anywhere you, where you can find open space to exercise and, and free space, there's less of it in, in more urban areas. Obviously in Duluth we have, we have more accessible areas to, to exercise and get active. In the cities there's, there's much less opportunity there. And then uh, along with that urbanization kind of point goes the childhood PE program. So like um, <clears throat> inner city programs that might be low on funding and they need to cut certain things, the PE program might be one of the first things to go and that's maybe some of the populations that need it most is, is those inner city kids who don't have the space to, to exercise and get out there and then kind of be active. So um, taking into account that certain areas might not have it as extensive of the physical education program as some other areas. And then I just bring it back to safety. Um, if you don't feel safe in your neighborhood, you're probably not going to want to go out and exercise. So, like, if, if you know that as soon as the evening hits or as soon as the nighttime hits and it doesn't get very friendly outside, um, that can be a barrier and that can be preventing you from exercising and, and uh, getting your steps in or getting your minutes in. So, then we got age barriers for children. So, um, one big barrier is family habits. So, kids are a product product of their environment, they're a product of who they're raised in, so more often than not, kids are a reflection of who their parents are. So if the parents have poor habits, they don't value exercise, they don't value a balanced diet, they have an insane amount of screen time, the kid is likely going to be dealt the wrong hand off the start. They're not kind of given an equal opportunity. Um, their, their parents are not telling them and not um, giving them um, the adequate amount of exercise and activity that they need. Additionally to that, um, some age barriers for children include having equipment that is too small or ill-fitted. So there's not really any equipment that's specifically made for kids. There might be a little bit, but there's not as many pieces of equipment that are strictly made for kids. So um, using that can be, can be a challenge. Um, but then in that same vein, we need to recognize that maybe kids aren't the most effective when using equipment. And so we need to kind of break it down. Like I said in this next point, we need to lessen the rules, kind of dial it back, and just more focus on play. We just want to get that heart rate up, simple as that. Add less rules, add less instruction, and just say, hey, the floor is lava, or I want you to run there, or you're rotten eggs, stuff like that. Just making it overall fun and kind of taking away the, the kind of the hard work aspect or the, the strictness of it. And then we got age barriers for older adults. So these older adults, I kind of touched on this earlier about kind of uh, physical barriers, but these older adults, they have a fear our risk of injury and so they think that oh if I start going to the gym I might get hurt and I might not be able to do this and that um, but in fact it might just have the opposite if they don't go to the gym and they don't start exercising and be more active they might actually be more susceptible to falls and more susceptible to being injured as well as with arthritis and joint pain they think that oh I wake up in the morning I go to bed I, I just feel in so much pain my knees my hands my wrists all that stuff um, they think like oh if I just if I keep on moving it'll make it worse but I don't, I don't know who specifically said that, but motion is lotion. The more you keep on moving, the more you're going to be able to keep on moving. So kind of like we want to stay active so we can keep being active. If we, if we start being sedentary, then that's only going to lead to bad things. And then as well, lack of education, lack of, lack of experience. Um, these older adults didn't grow up in the same environment that we did. They didn't have the same resources as we did. And we've even read a lot of uh, in the Fitness Academy newsletters that there have been certain times where a personal trainer might think, all right, yeah, I just want you to do a five minute warm up on a treadmill. But you get an older adult, they might not have any idea how to use a treadmill whatsoever. So one big issue is that trainers could assume that these populations know how to use the equipment, they're, they're knowledgeable enough to use it safely, but they might be too embarrassed to say anything, they might be kind of timid and shy, and so um, that could result in injury from them not being able to know how to use the equipment. All right, and so that brings me to my demonstration. So these. This demonstration is, I would say, more specifically for older populations, just because um, these are pretty sparing activities that uh, have really low risk. So, I'll actually have everyone perform this. So you guys don't need to stand up, but you guys can just like scoot out of your chair. The first one will be a simple sit to stand. So, we've done this before, and so you basically start at the top. You want to avoid like using your arms on your chair at all, but basically you start in the sitting position and just stand up stand down. So you do like three, four reps of this, and that's basically the sit-to-stand exercise. So I want you to perform two or three sit-to-stands, if you want to, it's up to y'all. All 
All right, and then the next one can be really simple. You could use this with a uh, resistance band or maybe even ankle weight, or if a person is really limited, you could also just do body weight and just sitting leg extension. So basically just sticking out your leg, holding it there for a few seconds, and then bringing it back down. Really simple, really low risk. And then we can go to the same position, you can go lateral raises, just out to the side here. Super easy on the joints. You can have wrist weights with this as well, or maybe some small dumbbells as well. And you can also just switch it to the front raises as well. These are really simple exercises that anyone can do. No space, very little time requirement. Um, and the equipment is very accessible. Um, and really simply shoulder press can be done as well. Sitting down in the same position, just like that. And then uh, this next one is heel slide. So basically, you want to have your foot in contact with the floor. You're basically just going to slide out, feeling every inch along the way, and you're going to bring it in, feeling the tension in that hamstring, and then you do the same thing with the other side there. So that's basically a demonstration of chair exercises, stuff that can be useful for uh, older populations that have maybe a higher fall risk. And so in conclusion, um, it's important to identify variants and implement strategies to overcome them. So with each individual, you've got to figure out, okay, what's preventing me from exercising? What behavior changes do I need to make to overcome these barriers? What, what do I need to change in my life? And what goals do I set, my, do I set for myself to help adhere to my program and keep on exercising? These are important questions you need to ask and, and make sure you figure them out um, when you're trying to stick with the program there. So that's the end of it. That's what I got. Does anyone have any questions? All right.